On the other hand, you probably read some of Claude Steele's work on um, uh, stereotype threat, which talks about how, um, for example, African American students performing as well as their white peers when they're told their test is an exercise, or when they're told it's a measure of their intelligence, it affects the way in which they um, respond, are able to perform on test. And so what I want to do is show you a video that was actually developed by a young woman, like a, I think she was 16 at the time. HBO had a um, summer program for kids to help them learn how to make videos. And she decided that she wanted to recreate the um, Kenneth uh, Clark doll test where you show kids a doll and see <laughs> a black doll and a white doll and see their responses. And so let me just... Um, Every black female has a big butt and big boobs. Loud, obnoxious, ghetto. Light skin being more attractive than dark skin. We're not smart. We're this way, we're that way. And a lot of times we have to prove ourselves as not being true. At a young age, I already knew the standards for a girl like me. As I become older, they become more obvious. You have to have permed hair, relaxed hair. You know, straight hair or like blonde hair, you know, long weaves or something. And if it's natural, that's even, that's, that's good hair. Like bad hair is hair you have to relax because it's kinky. Like it's not like appealing to have like natural hairstyles. Or like if they are natural, they have to be like the curly head, like black girl. Or something that looks mixed or something. And I remember when I first started wearing my hair natural, at first my mom was okay with it. And she, she thought it, it looked nice. And then after like the second day, she was like, oh, stop that. She was like, you're starting to look African. I was like, well, I am African. And that really pissed me off. There are standards that are imposed upon us. Like, um, you know, you're pretty, you're prettier if you're light skinned. I knew people in the past that like, just like, wanted to be light-skinned, not for any particular reason, you know, because they love themselves. I mean, they, they love themselves except for, you know, the color of their skin. Like, my siblings are all lighter than me, and my, um, my mom, she's dark-skinned, but she's lighter than me. So, like, I noticed, and I was like, hey, how come I'm the darkest, and, you know, everybody else is so light, and I don't know. Since I was younger, I, I also considered being lighter as a form of beauty or, you know, Beautiful, more, be you know, beautiful than being dark skinned. So I used to think of myself as being ugly because I was dark skinned. I knew people who actually like went out there and got you know bleaching cream and everything. They actually like you like laid in the tub, like poured like capfuls of bleach into it just so they could like see if their skin would get lighter. But yeah, my aunt that lives in Honduras, she basically started using skin bleaching cream when she was about 25. And she started her oldest daughter on it when she was about 11. And then she has an even younger daughter that was about six when she started using the skin bleaching cream on her. I've seen people say that I would never marry a dark skinned man because, you know, because I don't want that in my gene pool. On the other hand, light skinned girls have their issues too. We've been called high yellow, conceited house nigga. I feel like both sides have their issues. I guess I sort of felt like I, there was not any attention towards me because of maybe my skin color or because my hair was kinky or, you know, just basically that. Or even when, also when I was younger, like, say there was, there was, I don't know, a doll. I used to have a lot of dolls, but most of them were just white dolls with long straight hair that I would comb and I would be like, oh, I wish I was just like this. Barbie doll. In Brown versus Board of Education, the famous case that desegregated schools in the 1950s, Dr. Kenneth Clark conducted a doll test with black children. He asked them to choose between a black doll and a white doll. In most instances, the majority of the children preferred the white doll. I decided to reconduct this test as Dr. Clark did to see how we've progressed since then. Can you show me the doll? that you like best or that you'd like to play with? This one. I like that one. I'm killing. This one. That one? This one. I like to play with this. And can you show me the doll that is the nice doll? 
And why is that the nice doll? He's white. And can you show me the doll that looks bad? Okay. And can you give... And why does that look bad? Because it's black. Hmm. And why do you think that's a nice doll? Because she's white. And can you give me the doll that looks like you? Fifteen out of the 21 children preferred the white doll. Our ancestors came to, the, to this country and they were pretty much ripped, ripped out of their culture. You know, they couldn't speak their language. They couldn't, you know, they couldn't be themselves. They had to be like, like what everybody else told them to be. When you don't know where you're from, and you don't know what country you're from, all you know is basically you're from Africa, that's all you're given. I feel like it brings on like a lot of ignorance and it, it builds a lot of anger. I've seen, like, I've seen it build a lot of anger in a lot of black young females. Like, I don't know, they feel like, because they, like, they feel like they have a right to disown any kind of, you know, African roots. I think for a black girl in general, it's like you're missing a piece of you, you know? And for me, yeah, it's like, oh, I, I don't have any, any actual heritage, not heritage, but culture. <laughs> like, I know I'm, I'm from Africa, but, you know, different, the different countries in Africa have their different cultures, their different morals, their different values. And not knowing that just, it, it sort of keeps us at a loss. And we just, I feel like we're, busy searching for it while everybody else in society is throwing their ideas and what they believe we should be at us but you know personally we know that's not what we should be but we're gonna take it because we ha we don't know exactly what it is that we should be because we don't really know where we came from this film which I find painful every time I see it but it's a vivid example I think of how structural racism our knowledge context in particular can have so many negative effects on so many levels we see it playing itself out in systems in institutions but we also see how it affects children um, at this age as well as you know the other um, chart that we were showing about sort of how people respond in the criminal justice system to these things with lots of outcomes. So not to end on such a low note, let's see if I can get this back up on the screen, um, we want to, I want to talk a couple of minutes about what we think this framework means for people who care about and want to work on promoting racial equity. So internal change it's really accepting racial equity and Keith talked about how we think about racial equity as a central tenant and operating principle um, in our work and in our organizations and we think it's important to try to align the internal work and policies and practices with um, external work so that the uh, theme of racial equity is um, is consistent but really looking at improving not just on improving outcomes for all but also on reducing um, uh, racial gaps, not just looking at diversity, but also looking at opportunities and leadership and advancement. And policy change, um, we want to look at really working to change the fundamental uh, rules of the game, focusing on distribution of resources in terms of money and infrastructure and opportunities and so on. In terms of practice, focusing carefully on the ways in which standard practices may be reproducing or failing to counteract racially disparate um, outcomes in ways which we might not even notice if we're not paying attention um, to these things, both in terms of informal practices within organizations, but also among those in the your grantees or systems that you're working with. And I know, I know you guys have countless of examples of uh, practices that sort of help to reproduce structural racism, and I know it's part of what you're working on trying to address. And, and also this, this representations or cultural piece, which is so critical, um, trying to reframe some of these messages, um, challenging assumptions. I mean, that's been part of our theory of change about this, is that if we can get people who are in leadership positions, who have peers and networks that they're um, 
influential with who can make changes without um, uh, they're in positions where they can make changes, that we can get those people to understand um, what this ball of wax is and to be able to deconstruct it and analyze it, look in their own communities and see where structural racism is playing out, um, that we can begin to make some progress on this. And what we found is that um, we can actually, through these racial equity trainings, create a cognitive shift where people begin to understand how these pieces fit together and they become more willing to go out and challenge um, uh, and, and bring others into um, play. We have one example of this is in Jacksonville, Florida. We had, um, let's see, I guess in 2005 we had, a, we had leadership teams from community foundations from seven cities come to a training seminar and we followed up with some of them. One of the ones that I think has made some of the most progress has been in Jacksonville, Florida, where the president said, you know, she came in thinking that individual responsibility was really like the main way to understand where these disparities came from and that she now understood the historical piece and the other factors. Well, she's gone back and she has um, been a convener bringing back um, the key leaders in that city, the mayor, the head of the fire department, sheriff, um, school board, school superintendent, chair, school board, and has had them go through a seminar. And this group of people decided at the end of the seminar that they would make a statement, and they have actually the publisher of the newspaper there, that structural racism is a problem in Jacksonville, which was like a huge mm -hmm. um, thing for them to say. And they've continued to meet and are trying to work through this racial equity theory of change to identify where they want to try to make progress on, um, on uh, um, uh, on racial equity, we've seen that with others. The other thing that I want to mention, which I think is, and there's support in the literature for racial equity training that's done within a particular context, a particular way, that they have seen you can make shifts in people's cognitive views about race and um, catalyze them to engage in behavior to promote um, racial equity. The other thing is, one of the things we've been really trying to get a better handle on now is, um, research from cognitive scientists about, um, you know, they've done all this research on, on implicit bias and how like 80% of the people who take this implicit biases, regardless of, of race, um, show some implicit bias. Well, there's, a, there's information that these res researchers are finding, these neuroscientists and social psychologists and others, um, some, some, a lot of which I think are on your, on, in your center, have talked about how they're like these, to me, it looks like small things. I'm not a cognitive scientist, but it looks like relatively small interventions that can disrupt this implicit um, bias, that can make people more receptive to understanding these things, but also willing to um, try to do something about this. There's also research about how to increase empathy among people and an openness, a greater openness to, um, uh, to social policy. There's also research that's coming out about social contact and how to um, structure social con um, contact across different racial groups in a way that will um, make those relationships um, more productive. And in neuroscience, they're now learning that you know different parts of the brain are stimulated, um, particularly the fear center of the brain. People are showing pictures of, sorry, African-American males, but you can disrupt that with different kinds of techniques. Um, and, our, and so, there's a lot, I think, to be hopeful um, about in this work, and um, we're still trying to learn as much as we can uh, about this, and, and hopefully this has been somewhat helpful to you, and we can sort of stop and have dialogue, and then Keith is going to um, take you through a, a brief exercise um, that we do over a longer period uh, where we've applied our um, theory of change approach to racial equity, um, racial equity work. So I'll stop.